New York City. Yeah. I love it here. No, seriously, yeah. I've been spending a lot more time in New York. We'll be here a lot more the rest of the year. So um, I'm very excited to be able to come by the week as well. Thank you so much for the invitation. And two excellent presentations beforehand. You guys already know what's in 3.7. Uh, who knows what's in 3.8? <laughs> I'll tell you a few things about 3.8 before we go into the questions and answers. Or maybe just questions and then I'll talk about whatever happened. First thing you should know about 3.8, it's coming out December 12th. Dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> that means the code will freeze on December 5th and the beta closes tomorrow at 4 p.m. New York time. So if you want any enhancements or new stuff, the 3.8 is small enough to be a track ticket. Get it in before 4 p.m. tomorrow. It's your last window. Um, otherwise, we have this awesome update functionality. You can catch on the next releases. Uh, three big user things for me. So as you said, 3.7 was largely an infrastructure release. Although the auto updates are huge, I think the feature we'll talk about in 3.7 10 years from now is actually language facts. I think it's going to be even huger. That was a word. Uh, but 3.8, there is. We just have a bunch of letters, it's like an alphabet soup. So we have MD6, THX, and dash, D-A-S-H. Uh, dash is the new WP admin slash index.php. Uh, an iteration, we're cleaning it up, because we haven't looked at that page in many, many years. Uh, uh, THX stands for theme experience, essentially. And the appearance page is now, in my opinion, the funnest page in the entire WordPress app. Check it out in front. It's actually kind of fun to play with. And then finally, MD6. Who's a tester of MD6? Just out of curiosity. We got a handful in here. Um, you guys are living in the future. <laughs> it started as a plugin. It's been worked on the better part of a year now. And it's a, a reimagining of the aesthetics of the WordPress admin, which are largely unchanged since 2.7. So. Uh, but it's not just a paint job, it actually makes the entire WordPress admin responsive as well. So the admin works as beautifully on a large wide 27 inch screen as it does on a tablet or phone. And it uh, took a lot of work, but it was an amazing team. I think 14 contributors, 15 contributors have been working on it. And now we have it in 3.8. So round of applause for those guys, including Helen, who's here. So, I'm Matt, <laughs> ma.tt. You might have seen my link in your links widget or <laughs> hidden in your dashboard somewhere. Uh, Co-founder of WordPress over a decade now, 10 and a half years, uh, which makes me feel so old to say that. Uh, founded a company called Automatic about eight years ago that does uh, Jetpack, WordPress.com, VaultPress, add-on services for WordPress and um, also leading the 3.8 release, which is why I can say for sure it's coming out on December 12th. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to entertain any sort of questions you guys have uh, about WordPress, broader stuff, uh, whatever you want to talk about. So I guess we got a mic going around. Do a raise your hand and say your name and sh any blog you want to mention. Uh, definitely mention that, thanks. Uh, quick question, and I'm just going to write all of you and start this out on a tech question a little bit. Uh, MVC framework, why are we not seeing this in WordPress yet? Is, is there uh, any intention to move to a framework of some kind? Sure. So, no intention to move to a framework of some kind. Um, MVC as a design pattern can be useful in certain contexts. In fact, if you look at certain parts of WordPress, it's MVC-like. Um, but strictly adopting that framework has no user benefit. And so really you think, well, what would be the developer benefit? And if you look at how you can use the APIs within WordPress, both the public and sort of public-facing ones and the private ones, uh, the theme system, and oh, how you can develop within WordPress, you can actually take a very MVC-type approach. And some themes actually take this pretty far. Um, and so we don't see there being a developer benefit. And also, personally, I think that it's a little bit harder to grok, especially for newer developers. And one of the advantages of WordPress has been always from the very beginning, since the Hello Dolly plugin, right? that you could open that up and know how to write a plugin. Uh, you didn't have to figure out class inheritances and a bunch of other things. 
the aspect oriented um, plugin and theme infrastructure, well, plugin and uh, action and filter infrastructure of WordPress, I think is, is more intuitive than many of the other approaches I see some of our contemporaries like Drupal and Joomla take. And so we always think about not just the user experience from a user point of view, but from a developer point of view. So someone who might be learning to code for the first time, they start poking around WordPress, how can they figure it out? Um, that's why we've been working a ton on documentation. And why personally, and some of you have probably run into this, if you ever look at a function and you wind up like eight functions deep trying to figure out what it does, it breaks my heart a little. So as, as simple as we can make things, but no simpler, is always our approach. Thank you for the question. We had one back there. Oh, oh, right there first, and then we'll bounce back up. Um, I saw your post about plugins everywhere, and um, I have a blog, and I'm thinking about kind of branding it. So it's, instead of using my name.com, mm -hmm. um, we have a branded name that you know I can kind of venture out. So I guess my question is, for blogging, do you, what's your take on uh, having a name that's brandable or just using your name? Huh. So I like putting my name in things. <laughs> Automatic. A lot of a lot of people don't realize that's why there's two T's. Um, apparently, some people here didn't know that. Yeah, automatic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my original domain was actually called Photomat. Um, one thing I learned about the branded names is sometimes what you what if you make them too descriptive, sometimes what you're really into changes. So before Photomat, I was Saxmat because I really like playing the saxophone. Then became more of a photo guy, and I was Photomat. I still kind of use Photomat because I just got the handle on everything. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed as my interests have diverged and evolved over the past decade or so um, is my name. So I'm still Matt. <laughs> and I've just been getting all those domains I could. I have Matt.ly, Matt.co, Matt. I got Matt. Everything. I get angry emails from other Matts around the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be like George Foreman. I'm gonna call all my, he calls all his kids George, his eight Georges. I don't know if you, knew, you guys knew that. Men and women, or boys and girls. So I'm just gonna call all my kids Matt, and I wanna have a domain for each of them. <laughs> Matt Lee. Um, so I always come back to the name as something that is very permanent. Um, other than that, I like things where you take something that doesn't sound like what you do at all, and then imbue it. Um, WordPress isn't probably the best example. You know what's a better one is Amazon. What does Amazon have to do with, think of what Amazon meant 20 years ago. Um, a jungle, right, where a huge amount of biodiversity is in the, in the world. You have it as an adjective, like an Amazon man or woman, really tall person. Like what, what does that have to do with what they do? Nothing at all. But they made it about what we all think about first when we think of Amazon now. And that's so, so powerful because it's really not about what words you're using, unless that word already has existing connotations. If you can take something and make it the first thing people think about is you, ah. In fact, there was a challenge for WordPress in the very beginning. Um, for those of you who are old school, remember that at the time when WordPress got introduced, 90-95% um, of the market was on a system called Movable Type. And the makers of that sixth part had just introduced something called TypePad. Uh, that was their hosted service, it launched at TED, huge, huge, huge deal. The biggest criticism of the WordPress name when it started was it sounds too much like TypePad, which sounds silly now, like they're completely different. <laughs> they only share a few letters. <laughs> uh, but at the time, TypePad had so much mind share that just something with two syllables, and I guess type and word are kind of related, uh, seemed too close to people. And so it's a good example of the power that they had at the time. Because you guys asked the first two questions, you guys actually get a prize. <laughs> I have two WordPress iPhone 5 cases. Uh, you asked the first question, so you get to choose whether you want black or green. No, which, which color do you want? Blue You're wearing a green shirt. All right, there you go. Round of applause for these guys. Lucky question now. It's always good to be the first, and especially being up here, 
that silence before the first question is the longest amount of time in the world. So, uh, how about right over here? Uh, we're passing the mic to you. Just a minute. I, I'm out of I'm out of iPhone cases. Uh, the I went to the Google uh, PageSpeed tool mm -hmm. and tested some WordPress. I tested quite a few different WordPress URLs, mm -hmm. and invariably Google uh, Google analyzed them. And in each case, it's render blocking. Uh, JavaScript, and yeah, yeah. JavaScript and okay. CSS above the fold, move it down below. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is what WordPress does. What uh, is <laughs> is that? Are you going to address that? Or Google doesn't like the way WordPress. <laughs> Google doesn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> all of that is dependent on your theme. At the end of the day. So your theme can control all the output, including where the actions are called that outputs to JavaScript normally. Um, there are plugins, including I think W3 Total Cache and Super Cache, that can modify how some of those things are presented to put it in a way that's more Google friendly. But honestly, I would recommend if you're into it, um, well first, see how your site loads. Like uh, built into Chrome now is a web inspector. So you can right click, click inspect element, go to the network tab, and then do a force reload to see just about how long on a normal connection, just to kind of give you an idea of your, um, your loading time. And look for there what's taking up the most time. So you might have, I've seen friends who they're like, my site's loading slow, I know they had an unresized image. It was just a thumbnail like this big, but it was loading like two megabytes, right? And so th those sorts of things, there might be some easy quick wins. Um, so look for the easy stuff first, and then, but you can go so deep into doing CDNs and concatenating scripts and you know, minimizing H HTML and changing the order of how things are called. Uh, WordPress loads it early because that is often the most compatible way to do it. That way if there's something that's trying to load it right after, WordPress normally loads it. If we haven't loaded, like say jQuery already and they call one of the jQuery functions, it just errors out. So sometimes reordering that can be a little bit tricky, which is why we don't do it by default. Mm -hmm. uh, what were those critiques by Google? Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to argue with Google. <laughs> you know, that, that's, I don't know if that's a good side of an argument to be on. Um, but it's all, I would say, uh, it's a continuum. Uh, more performance is always more better, right? Like, you, no one ever said, I wish that website took a little longer to load. <laughs> uh, but sometimes, eking out that last bit of performance, um, there's a diminishing marginal returns. So I said, go for the low-hanging fruit first and look at what on your page, or maybe by switching themes, you might be able to optimize. And maybe look for a theme, including the, some in the directory, that talk about having more optimized HTML and CSS. Okay, because I haven't found, I haven't found one, a theme that loads it everything. At the bottom. Well, yeah. by default, that's, that's a more advanced technique. I would say, I don't know how Google prioritizes that. I'd put that as a lower priority, no, but high. definitely, they, 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 they said it's high. It's high well, you can't argue with Google bad. then. And supposedly that entry Does anyone know a plugin that could uh, change that? You have to use required JS or something. I mean, I think for some of your stuff, or I think I mean, one of the problems that I ran into was that. Yeah, we can mic it. With, with the script manager, you can queue up scripts with dependencies on other external scripts. But if you have any inline script tags in your page, yeah. you can't you can't uh, you can't make those dependent on uh, uh, I guess on scripts that have to load externally. So, is there any way that you can actually uh, make script blocks and queuable in the script uh, you know, in the script manager? It would make it a lot easier to actually uh, implement mm. it such that all the script blocks also got moved to the bottom of the page. Below jQuery would actually be need to fall, but I guess uh, short of that, I think you have to do like require JS or some sort of basic this module definition. What you could do, you could hook to the footer and say, I have a water. Uh, oh, thank you. I would categorize that under more advanced technique, like something that you really have to dive into the code to do. Well, thank you. Oh, full service. We get water opening and everything. Uh, next question. How about all the way in the back there? Blue shirt. Hi, my name is Judy. 
Uh, I begin this plugin error 0x4 three. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to tell you. <laughs> my, uh, my question is so this is obviously a technical community, um, you know, a lot of developers and designers. Uh, you're talking about things like MVC and you know, making things simpler. That's a big part of WordPress. We can talk a little bit about the uh, philosophy of the user experience and how much that plays into uh, you know, what's going to 3.8 beyond that, uh, you know, how that plays in beyond uh, the technical coverage. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that could be a whole night discussion. It's um, one of the things that's unique. Uh, actually, just the other week, I spoke at the, the Joomla World Conference. I generally, their, their WordCamp San Francisco, essentially. Um, I spoke at it. And one of the things, it, it was very interesting to learn about their community. I think there's a lot. And actually, it's funny, the next day I went to Acquia and hung out with Dries from Drupal. <laughs> so I felt like I got all my uh, open source CMSing in, in one weekend. Um, it's interesting to see the different decisions folks make. And one thing that's distinct about WordPress that was raised by a few of their community members is we have a philosophy page. So if you go to wordpress.org slash about slash philosophy, there's a series of principles. Um, one of them is decisions not options. Um, there's sort of things that we hold to be true, um, but interestingly, they're not useful as rules per se. Uh, one of the designers I work with a lot is named uh, Yoan, and he just wrote a post on his blog NoScope that I blogged on MA.TT as well. That said how decisions on options um, can be used for evil as well as good. Uh, I like to say that smart people can rationalize anything, and so you can use any guideline or any sort of principle as, a, as an argument almost on either side of any decision. Um, the thing that I would say is probably most true and most universal is that a user is never wrong. So if they're saying, I'm having trouble with a thing, I can't figure it out, you can't say, oh, you're wrong, you need to do this instead. It's, it's almost like a feeling is never invalid. Like, <laughs> if they had trouble with it, they had trouble with it. And there's something that could be more intuitive or inline help that might help. Maybe eliminating the feature altogether so they don't even have to think about it. I mean, there's a million ways to skin that cat and approach pretty much any side of it. And to the WordPress has been successful over the years, I think it's because we've tried not to get too attached to the things that we've done before and don't mind re-examining even some of our base assumptions about what that user experience should be necessarily. Um, it gets harder as you're bigger and, and honestly more successful to make that shift because you want to look at what has made you successful in the past and assume or believe that that's what's going to make you successful in the future. So that's why personally I always think about speed and agility. Um, are we moving fast enough? Because at least if we do something wrong, we'll do it quickly and not spend a whole year doing something wrong. We'll learn from it, do it again. Um, and then agility. Like how do we... 3.8 was an example of trying to radically change our development methods. So versus instead of kind of the a core commit team working on a set of features and decided ahead of time, et cetera, et cetera. We had these plugin teams, which had basically complete autonomy, um, very light supervision. The plugin lead was kind of the, the lead of that. They weren't subserving it to even me as the 3.8 lead. And working on these features and working on them independent of core and plugins. As an example of trying something that honestly, if you had told me we were going to do that three years ago, I would have said, ah, never. That's silly. Um, but we did it. And it worked pretty well. Let's see on December 12th how well it worked. <laughs> and actually, it's funny because I'm, I'm already thinking about 3.9. <laughs> because it, it's not, 3.8 is far from done. There's going to be a lot of work in the next couple of weeks. But my head, we're kind of past, we're out of the, we're out of the jungle. Right? We, we've gotten past the hard part, which was seeing if those plugins would even be ready, those teams working together, setting up you know, the week, how the weekly meetings would work and everything like that, all the structural things that created the environment that I hope those things could thrive in, and they've done well so far. Um, the beta process and you know, hitting the release date is largely, I think, a, a method of being strict about freezing the code, actually, which sometimes we're bad about. Uh, but 3.9 is going to be where it's really tested. So the release I'm not leading, the, the one after this, when maybe we didn't have 3.7, two releases going on simultaneously, so we started a few things a few months before. Uh, it's another thing that this week, if you have an idea that you'd like to be work on as a plugin for inclusion according to 3.9, kind of 
this week is the kind of talk about it. And we talked about it at the dev meeting. So dev meetings happen every Wednesday, 4 p.m. local, uh, New York time, and they are on IRC. So it's an open channel, anyone can join. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about 3.9 features tomorrow. It's tomorrow, right? Okay, <laughs> I lose track of days sometimes. <laughs> it's the downside of working seven days a week. <laughs> Weekends aren't as delineated. Also, like, I remember how big a deal summer used to be, right? You're like, oh my God, summer! And now it just kind of passes and goes, and I'm like, oh wow, it's getting cold, and I need a jacket, and I wonder if the WordPress sticker is still on it. And <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, but we'll go to the next one. Uh, how about another blue shirt? And then we'll pop to the front here, because this row is on fire. You're next. <laughs> Hey man, uh, my name is Alexi. Um, I am more of a young boy guy. A boy guy. <laughs> but uh, I work with a bunch of guys uh, at a small job in Manhattan. Um, we have uh, some clients running workplace or uh, getting back in workplace. Mm -hmm. And my question is uh, uh, more uh, about uh, platform as a service. And uh, hosting services such as, uh, not actual hosting, but services such as uh, WordPress and uh, VIP, uh -huh. or in the global world we have Pantheon or Django, we have Roku. So, uh, um, what are your thoughts about that um, new way of doing things? Because uh, I, I am a, a programmer, but I used to enjoy those times when I was able to tweak my servers and yeah. do updates and do all that kind of stuff when things go well, but when things go wrong, it's a total nightmare. <laughs> and services like WordPress VIP promise to uh, uh, avoid all those problems. You just focus on your business logic and yeah. you run the, the whole thing. But you also lose flexibility uh, uh -huh. in some cases. Um, so what are the results? If era of tweaking with your servers over, everything is going to be like WordPress or Google yeah. or something like that? So I do think that it's not that the age of the system is over, but it's over for most of us. Right? It's really important at Amazon or Automatic or someplace like that to have really, really fantastic systems folks. Uh, but hopefully, I mean, I've, I've been on call before and get the text messages when things go down. That's not a, a good way to live. <laughs> it's very stressful, um, especially before the advent of like tethering and everything that makes it easy now to get online. I would sort of say it as a spectrum. At this far end, um, starting at $60,000 per year, you have WordPress.com VIP. And it is the most bulletproof thing in the world. Uh, WordPress.com is now, depending on who's counting, a top five or top 10 website in the world. And you can run something on this exact same infrastructure. So that's gonna to be tough to break. And that's why there's less flexibility. The code gets audited and reviewed by people. So that's kind of at this end. So let's call that five grand per month. At this end, you have the $5 per month. <laughs> the blue host, the dream host, the go daddies of the world that actually have been getting a lot, lot better in prior years. Like we've all heard the horror stories about each of those three people I mentioned, and they're probably the biggest. Um, even GoDaddy has upped their game quite a bit. In fact, they just introduced uh, built-in uh, GoDaddy updating of your plugins and themes automatically. So in addition to the core stuff that's supported now, they'll update plugins and themes. Um, the infrastructure stuff that both DreamHost and Bluehost have done have been pretty impressive. And one of those accounts, plus good caching, like a super cache or total cache, um, can get you pretty far in terms of scaling, especially a simpler site, to even five, 10 million pages per day. In the middle has been kind of interesting. There's four major players. Uh, the three you guys probably know about are Pagely, uh, WP Engine, and ZippyKid, which I think just rebranded to Pressable? Pressable. Press, what's that? Pressable. Pressable. Um, these are, it aspire to be the Heroku of WordPress. And they're doing a pretty good job in a lot of ways. Um, I have qualms with some of them, like Pagely modifies core, which to me isn't kosher. Um, 
Sometimes their marketing can be a little aggressive, but by and large, they're well-intentioned and they're really trying to be this sort of more f total flexibility, so you get, you're able to change the code whenever you want and everything, and more in the kind of 20 to 30 dollar a month range. Um, so five, 20 to 30, 5,000 <laughs> to look at. The, the, the dark horse, which I think is really interesting, is Google App Engine. So Google App Engine now has support for WordPress, meaning that in an Amazonian <laughs> environment, um, on Google servers, you can have a WordPress. And I think it's free to like 25,000 pages per day, which is more than most of us get, let's be honest. <laughs> Certainly more than MA.TT. And um, I think that's going to be pretty disruptive. It's a little lame right now, but if they keep iterating on it and stick by it, it could be possibly the default way for people to run WordPress in the future. Oh, thank you. How about up here? So, I'm a blogger, oh. um, WordPress creates WordPress for people like me. Now, hold, hold the mic a little closer. Um, uh -huh. I'm a blogger, and so we know that WordPress creates WordPress sites for people like me. So then the question is, um, how can us bloggers contribute to WordPress? Um, uh -huh. And I think I kind of grapple with wanting to learn to, to learn code, and I will. Um, but at the same time, with the skills that I do have, you know, how can I contribute to the work? And I know we talked about um, the videos, adding, um, adding captions to videos, and that's huh? something on my list. But are there, are there other ways that we can contribute? Yeah, totally. Um, and thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, ways you can contribute. Uh, first, well, you said you want to learn to code. Highly recommended. Everyone in the room, I believe that scripting is new literacy and learning to program, even regardless of whether you want to do that in your life or not, changes the way you think. And it's an awesome skill to have. Um, as a blogger, one way, I would say first, is have an awesome blog. <laughs> the way a lot of people choose, how I chose my first blogging software, which was Movable Type, was I, the blogs I read that I loved, that's what they used. So when I clicked that Powered By link and I said, Ah, oh, this doesn't look too hard, I could do this. That's what I started with. So having a great blog with a Powered By link <laughs> is actually the best advertising in the world for WordPress um, because it shows the creativity and the, just what people can do. If you want to be more involved in the WordPress project directly, so something outside of just your personal evangelism, both through showing awesomeness and, of course, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up next week, right? Someone's going to ask about a website at that table. You all are that person in your family, probably. You're going to fix the Wi-Fi while you're there. <laughs> Update the 47 apps that haven't been updated on the phone. <laughs> oh, that drives me crazy. It's better now on iOS 7, but I would get a compulsion on my mom's phone when I would see, like, she had like 120 app updates. I'm like, how do you even have 120 apps? <laughs> I would just have to, I love updating things so much. It's like Christmas morning. <laughs> Divergence, uh, we'll go back on track. Uh, WordPress documentation. So there's these field guides that we've been working on in WordPress for a while. So if you can write English that other people can understand, you can help these. Uh, because it's been one of those projects that has been harder to get launched in many ways or iterated on. Um, so there's these field guides, which I think are awesome. The codex, of course. Um, how do you access the codex and the field guides? Uh, Google WordPress field guide, I can't think of the URL off the top of my head. And the codex is a wiki, so it's codex.wordpress.org. There's a mailing list for people to talk about this called wp-docs. So if you Google wp-docs, it's a, it's a mailing list. Like you put in your email and you start getting a bunch of junk in your inbox. <laughs> but, but junk from other people passionate about WordPress documentation. And uh, that's the group that works on these sorts of things. And um, they also have, on make.wordpress.org, they have a P2. So if you go to make.wordpress.org, we like verb subdomains, um, you can check out that group and kind of hang out with them. And um, it's, it's actually, honestly, at this point, I mean, the last, every given release, we have between 150 and 250 code contributors. There's only a small handful. You can count them with your hands and your toes, people who work on the documentation and the other parts of WordPress. 
And I think that I personally believe that in some ways we're at a point of diminishing margin returns of an incremental feature in WordPress. Like it already does a lot. A lot of our, I think the next, you know, we've reached 20%, I think kind of the next 20% of people adopting WordPress is going to be around education. It's people figuring out how to use some of the stuff we already have. And documentation, meetups like this are the way that's going to happen. Um, WordPress has never had a Super Bowl ad. Uh, the Wix, which is one of our competitors, uh, just filed to go public. They did go public. They spend $29 million a year on marketing. Um, I think they need to because they don't have awesome folks like you guys here in this room telling their family at Thanksgiving <laughs> that that's what they should use. And more importantly, that you're going to help them set it up. And we've always, we've always grown one blog at a time. And I think that's the most important for every single person here in this room. Like the next person, the person that you help get going with WordPress and get them auto updating and secure and all that sort of jazz. Uh, it's the best thing in the world. It makes me happy. Thank you. Right in front of you, I had a question that I wanted to jump to. Hi, Matt. I'm Jane. I Wikipedia you uh, this evening. <laughs> and I wanted to know if it was true if you really typed 120 words per minute. <laughs> that sounded amazing. Uh, I can, yeah. I, I type in a different keyboard layout called Dvorak. Um, for those, Dvorak is basically, so QWERTY was designed in the typewriter age. And one of the problems you have when you have arms coming out when you press a, a button was those arms running into each other. So who knows what the most common two letter combination in the English language is? A-N. A-N, nope. TR? No, you're close. TH. Who said TH? Sorry, I don't have any more prizes. Uh, but that's cool to know. So TH. Um, on Dvorak, that's like that. That's two of the strong. So also different fingers have different strengths. So it's two of the strongest fingers on the home row. Um, on QWERTY, that's kind of all over the place. And that's so when you type words like the or the, um, however you spell it, that the arms don't run into each other. They were going to switch, so they created this new system called Dvorak. There's a slightly better system called Colmac um, that are basically optimized for most, all the vowels are on the home row and one of the most common, uh, what's the non-vowel called, a consonant? Yeah. <laughs> Non-vowels on the other hand. So you can type, actually a lot of words on the home row. I read a stat once that said like, in an average year, a QWERTY typist, their fingers move about 12 miles and a Dvorak typist will move about one mile. So it's, it's a lot more efficient in many ways. And the very fastest typists in the world, like the world records in competitions, tend to be Dvorak or Comac. Uh, so I switched to it like 12, 13 years ago. And I still use it to this day. And I used to think I was really cool until I got beaten in a typing speed contest relatively recently by uh, someone who was actually here, Helen. Helen, can you wave? <laughs> Core contributor Helen um, has wicked fast fingers in QWERTY. So, Internal to automatic, a few times, we've done a kind of typing throwdowns where someone will challenge and we do a contest and whoever types faster, the loser switches to the other person's layout. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very glad Helen and I did not do this, um, but since that uh, humiliating defeat, I have been practicing a little bit <laughs> and getting my speeds back up because in that, you know, I. I, I love this site called Type Racer. Check it out. It's actually a pretty lame website, but it's really fun, and you race other people in typing. Uh, <laughs> it's what I do on Saturday nights. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so Type Racer is pretty neat, and um, and I can I can hit 120s, 130s on there. Uh, but in that contest, I was like in the 80s and 90s. Like I was kind of blowing wind. So I, I need to get back up. Well, right here, up here in front. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm a uh, both novice WordPress user, uh, not so much a year in now, but most definitely a novice programmer. I've taken my first introduction to Python class and found that um, and I, it did struggle through it, uh -huh. but it did finish. So I'm realizing that I do, I think that I can be proficient with it. So my question then is, if WordPress is going to be my platform, and it is, uh -huh. 
um, what do I really want to focus on program-wise with new learning as I go? Huh. That's a great question. I would say the things that are most important are the things that are most fundamental to the web. So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, in particular order? I would say in that order. Yeah, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, HTML and CSS will allow you to shape WordPress, you know, and knowing the WordPress theming system, which you can learn even without knowing a ton of PHP or anything else. Um, you can make almost any site in the world. Like, you can make some pretty cool stuff. Um, JavaScript is where a lot of our more advanced functionality is going. And if you learn JavaScript, PHP will be a walk in the park, and so you'll be able to hack around with plugins and everything like that. Um, it's just where I would recommend starting versus maybe just starting with pure PHP. So, like, definitely, and the way I've always learned the most is just by picking something that I don't know how to do and then figuring it out. Often with lots of Googling and copying and pasting and, like, you know, hacking your way, and then you finish it and you're like, oh, wow, it works. You step back and you're like, and then you're like, man, I need to rewrite that. <laughs> then you start over again. And with every single iteration, you get better and better. Um, Reading other people's plugins. So learning enough about code that you can read others' code is huge. And jazz. Um, one of the ways you learn to solo is by transcribing other solos. You know, breaking it down, just using your ear, going through your favorite Sonny Rollins or whatever, and just going note by note until you can play it right along with them. Um, do that with a plugin. Break it down. And sort of try to get to the point where you can understand every line of that plugin and what it's doing. Start with a simple one. Hello Dolly's pretty good. <laughs> I'm a personal fan. <laughs> um, and just understand every single line and then try to rewrite it yourself. Then compare what you, from memory, compare what you wrote to what already exists and see if there's a way you can refactor it to make it more efficient or have fewer lines of code or have you know, fewer characters, even a single line of code. I mean, these sorts of things, in theory, it's kind of the way you learn anything. I mean, you read about Benjamin Franklin, he would take his favorite prose and memorize it and then you know, write out each sentence on a, on, a bun on a card, essentially, and then mix them up and then try to rearrange them in the order that he remembered and then compare the order he put them in into the order of the original. So just the ways, the most ways you can break down a task and then work on the components of that task is, in my opinion, the best way to learn coding, WordPress, music, writing, anything in the world. Those things are more related than people think. Cool. And congratulations. You're about to enter yeah. a whole I, new I, I world. Get to my first thing. It's, uh, I mean, it really is. It's, yeah, it's a new language. It's, I, I felt like I was learning a new language. And the new language is, it is learning a new language, but the good news is that once you learn one of them, the rest of them are way easier. So it's not like, you know, you're going from like French to Japanese. You're going from like Brazilian Portuguese to Portuguese. Like they're, they're way closer than, than further apart. Oh, <laughs> yeah, take the intro course twice. Cool. All right, next question. How about we go all the way to the back? You, sir. You had a content hand raise. Hey, Devin. Um, first, I just want to make a comment to that person that asked about how to get started. One thing that really put me over the top was a really great book called uh, Professional WordPress Plugin Development. And that got me just writing my own plugins. I went from not knowing nothing to like writing plugins in like a week. Great so recognition. Amazing. That's a great book actually. Yeah. Uh, my question is, do you think that WordPress will uh, change in the future the editor that you use to write posts? Um, I know there's been a lot of complaints about it, it's a little clunky. You switched from code view to uh, visual view, I think it'll like, change, sometimes change your code. I'm just wondering if that's something that's on the radar or not. Oh god, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Working on it. Thank you. Uh, how about we'll come how about right there, just so you don't have to run as much. Um, okay, so I'm actually on uh, two questions, but first of all I wanna uh, start with uh, thanking you and uh, expressing, I guess, our love because uh, if uh, you would have created WordPress, I would 
still probably playing hockey, and my mom would say, hey, find a job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the first question is, um, uh, I think last time I saw you, it's probably a year ago in New York, and uh, you wear the same jacket. <laughs> and, and you were uh, still cool guy, I think, and uh, how do you stay so grounded? First question. Second is, um, how do you sustain all these uh, offers from probably like Microsoft folks <laughs> to buy on that? Huh. Those are good questions. Um, personally, I, I just try to, I, I work with really great people. And so when you work with really great people, they, they won't let you get too far off course. <laughs> um, you know, the, certainly the people who I work closest with at Automatic on WordPress.core, and also just, you know, friends and family. So once you go back, you know, over a decade now, well, certainly my family does. <laughs> uh, you know, don't, don't hesitate to call BS or to, you know, uh, help you. I think that's really where being grounded comes from. I mean, what, what keeps you grounded is not anything you can do intrinsically. It's everything around you, right, holding you down in a good way. Um, in terms of courting offers for automatic or offers to sell or anything like that, for a lot of it, well, A, personally I'm not motivated by money as much anymore. Um, there's diminishing margin returns to that, just like anything, and, um, and we've been very successful already in terms of the company we've built and the success so far. And so it's more a matter of impact. And so the question isn't, well, could we get a billion dollars if we went to Google? And I says, yeah. But what would we do with that that would make a bigger difference than what we're doing today? And how, if at all, would being inside of a larger company enable us to impact the web in a bigger way? And we're talking about 20% of the web now. I mean, if there was some magical thing that could take us to 80% of the web within a year, that would be something I'd consider. But if it's just a capital thing, like, I don't think it's a you got to think about what's going to have the biggest impact on your world and, and the world. And for me, getting a bunch of money that I'm going to try to give away later, because you can't spend it all anyway, or waste it on stupid stuff, isn't going to have as big an impact on the world as the thing we're working on today. And so it's really just, uh, it's really just thinking about the long term, the next 5, 10, 20 years, and being focused on impact. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm so embarrassed I'm wearing the same jacket. I gotta like <laughs> It's my New York wardrobe, I gotta be honest. Like I have fewer clothes here. <laughs> cool. Uh, I think behind you a few there was a question. Uh, WordPress is uh, really flexible and can be used for a lot of things, not just a simple blog. So I'm curious, what's your personal favorite, like, crazy theme and crazy plug you can run into? Huh. Uh, the example I used at uh, WordCamp San Francisco, which I still like a lot. By the way, check out the State of the Word 2013 if you want to see sort of the broad, what's happened, where it's going, etc. Uh, it was, it's only a few months old, so it's not stale yet. Um, State of the word. So once a year, we give a, like the State of the Union address. The State of the Word address. Uh, every year in WordCamp San Francisco. I guess I've been doing it eight years now, seven years now. So it's one of those things that uh, we try to do. And it's one of those chances to take sort of a 10,000 foot view. And one of the examples I used, and I actually showed a video from it, is um, this Web Dev Studios thing. Was it Web Dev? Yeah. Uh, where they've created kind of an app for a YMCA where you could like hold a card up and the iPad app would scan it and then it would pull like different workout plans and things you had done before and pretty awesome. I mean, regardless of what it was doing and where it was doing it, just the idea that WordPress was being used as a backend for an app that had this really rich native functionality, um, I think is really fascinating because it doesn't really look like a blog or website at all. Uh, in terms of my favorite blogs and cool themes, I often go back to people who I admire generally. Uh, one of the, when I started WordPress, I actually made a list <laughs> of like, uh, I think it was six people who, like, if 
if WordPress could someday be good enough for them to be on, like, I could be happy. Um, we have five of them so far. <laughs> but the first one on the list was actually a New York native here, uh, Zeldman, Zeldman.com. Uh, still one of my web bios to this day. I remember when he switched from, because he hand coded a site for like 12 years. He wasn't going to switch to anything. So when he switched to WordPress, I was like, that it was just one of the better days. Um, Jay-Z, another New York, a Brooklyn native. <laughs> uh, Lifeandtimes.com, Jay-Z's magazine. Now to be fair, Kanye did it first. <laughs> In the music world, Kanye was the early WordPress adopter. Um, it's like the leather jogging pants he was talking about. He was on it before everyone else. Um, he no longer uses, he no longer blogs. I got to meet him weirdly, like a couple of weeks ago. And he knew what WordPress was, super cool. But you know, one of his problems is, I guess he struggles with uh, people changing his message. And I didn't make the case, but someone else in the room was like, well, you know, if you blog, you're your own mediator. Like no one's, the press isn't gonna be able to take the quotes out of context and things like that. And, and he really felt like he had done it already. Like he had finished. Um, but he was first, then Jay-Z adopted WordPress. And I love that site. It's actually a pretty cool site as well. So lifeandtimes.com. It's kind of a, a cultural magazine. And who was the first player? Oh, Zeldman.com. Uh, Z-E-L-D-M-A-N. He's a web designer, a web standards advocate. Kind of one of the grandfathers of the modern web. Um, or fathers of the modern web, he's not that old. <laughs> and the first one I talked about was this YMCA thing that I don't know a URL for, but if you check out the state of the word, uh, 2013, it's in there. You know, when the uh, YMCA wanted to badge OS.org, Oh, cool, so check out badgeos.org to see it. Thank you. Wrapping up questions, we have a little bit of time left? Oh, okay. Right up here. So if you were starting over again today and, uh, and you're writing WordPress, but it couldn't be in PHP, what, uh, <laughs> what language would you write it in? And what's one feature that isn't there today that you, you know, that maybe a competitor has, and maybe it's something in the cloud that, huh. that, you know, that you absolutely have to have that, that is maybe difficult to do today? If you do it differently if they're doing Huh. So the first one's easy. I mean, if, if, we're, if I were starting a, a brand new project today and didn't have to worry about web hosting or anything like that, I think I'd try it in Go. Uh, it's a language from Google. It seems really, really cool. Like the way they do real-time stuff, the way just the whole concurrency model, I dig it. Um, go, G-O. That's it. Go. It's probably hard to Google. <laughs> you think they think about this stuff, but um, maybe if you Google Go Google programming language, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> Uh, thing I would do differently. So, I mean, first, and we're kind of moving to this a little bit in every release, is making WordPress a lot more of a JavaScript application. So, I mean, w WordPress is born out of the days when web pages are more like documents and applications. So, even as a simple example, just the idea that there's pagination links on the comment screen, the pages screen, you know, also post screen, all sorts of screens have pagination. Um, why? Why not just have an infinite scroll? And as you filter, it just kind of filters it in real time and things like that. Um, I'd love to see search be better. So just the idea that in the WordPress admin alone, there's like eight different places you can search, eight different things. Um, be kind of cool to unify that. It's actually a project that might be in 3.9. That's one of the things that people are talking about for 3.9 as an Omni search project. Um, so thinking of it more real time and as an entirely client-side application, not unlike like a Gmail, where you would kind of load up this thing, maybe it's 500K of JavaScript, and it would be WordPress. And then all the rest would be sort of data calls, such as JSON over the wire, um, super fast, cached locally. If you're on mobile, maybe it stores like a whole copy of the database uh, on your mobile device. And then just working through these sort of APIs that both WordPress would use and other people could use too if they wanted to build things on top of it. That would be a pretty interesting way to architect it. A good follow-up would be, well, will that ever happen? <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
I mean, it's not going to happen in 3.9 or 4.0, but it's one of those things that piece by piece, as we iterate on different parts of WordPress, um, our philosophy around this, going back to philosophies, is that a, a ground up rewrite is really tough. Because A, it would probably, t I mean, it took us 10 years to get this far. Even if we assume that we're four times as good, let's say it takes two and a half years to just recreate our existing functionality in you know, a base level, so you wouldn't know anything changes. Probably a lot will happen in two and a half years. <laughs> we'll be on like iPhone 7 at that point, you know? Um, there's a lot that can change in that amount of time. So the world changes while you're rewriting. You break backwards compatibility, pretty much. And often you create all new bugs. Like maybe you fix some things, like this architecture thing, I'd say we do. But you're probably going to write several hundred new bugs in the process. But you're not going to know about it, and some of which you're not even going to notice until years later. So there's a huge built-in benefit to the iteration to iterative approach. And so what we try to do is, we don't do these giant refactors. But every single release of WordPress, we try to refactor you know, from 5 to 15% of it. Sometimes taking a more object-oriented approach, if it's right. Sometimes moving a lot of the functionality to the JavaScript side. So if you check out the way that THX works, or the new media library. Um, it's actually really cool uh, how really the bulk of that code is JavaScript. And just interacting with a very, very lightweight PHP play. That's why you should learn JavaScript. It's the future. Like plastics. <laughs> <laughs> Or Bitcoin, right? That's been a little crazy. <laughs> when WordPress.com introduced support for Bitcoin, it was $12. Just saying. <laughs> the next currency we support, you guys, you should buy. So that's our approach. And the thing is that those 10 or 15% you're doing every release add up over five or 10 releases, which might take two years, to almost a complete rewrite but you were getting use, user feedback along the way and not making as many new bugs. And you're, it's more of an iterative approach than a ground up approach. So I think we're gonna end up where 90% of the code in WordPress is gonna be JavaScript. And we're already at a point where a lot of the new functionality is more on the JavaScript side. It's gonna happen bit by bit. You're the man. You work for WordPress and you mentioned how many people have used WordPress as a traditional blogging platform. Or CMS or traditional CMS or app. But then there's also been some criticism that it's still very blocky. There's a bit of talk of it of forking WordPress, which is one of the Is there, you know, do you ever see a time when um, removing posts or categories, but in default post uh, statuses, you know, uh, won't break work? I guess it's so core to, to WordPress um, that removing them. The same way you remove any uh, collateral, which we call this a problem. So, do you want to see that as. I mean, removing poster pages would be pretty extreme. Um, I don't know if I could imagine that. But I do think that a lot more of what's happening, and this is one of the things I talked about, is that WordPress is simultaneously evolving as a blogging platform, so something you can use to create an awesome blog, as a CMS. And as an application platform simultaneously. And the reason for that is that we're creating a CMS that, by focusing on blogging first, we try to make it as easy as possible for the most number of people as possible. Because blogging is, blogging means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, a lot of what it means to me is that you can do it yourself. And you don't need to hire someone or have a PhD or know how to code to create a beautiful, amazing blog. The CMS parts of it are what we use to build that. And we evolve as an application layer because we need a world-class application layer, and we're not happy with any of the ones that exist out there right now, to build this best-in-the-world logging and CMS apps that we want to do. So now how decoupled those become in the future? I don't know. I think there is something to having a single WYSIWYG, for example, that we support. For all its imperfections, um, at least there's only one of them. Other CMSs have taken the approach where you can choose a WYSIWYG. So now you're not just dealing with one crappy one, you're dealing with four crappy ones. <laughs> you're building a plugin or something else on top of it. So I think sometimes it's good to, to choose a path and be able to build on that one path. Um, yeah, I guess that answers some of it, but not all of it. Partially because we don't know all of it. Go all the way to the back corner. Because you had your hand up for like a minute there. 
Okay, so uh, going back to what we were saying about uh, using more JavaScript in WordPress, do uh, you see WordPress doing more like uh, just core JavaScript or like JavaScript libraries like the jQuery, uh, things like that for the, the functionality? Absolutely. Uh, jQuery's been core to WordPress a long time. Like, I don't know, since early, early days of jQuery. They've always been kind of like a sister project, which has been pretty neat. Um, a lot of these new features utilize Backbone and those sorts of approaches to more, call it more modern JavaScript uh, than before. And we're starting to do things like even adopt a style guide for our JavaScript code, which we've never had before. I think that's a good example of maturity. Um, when you're arguing over braces and tabs and spaces and things, that's when you know you've made it. <laughs> so I feel like JavaScript is now a first class citizen in the WordPress world. And just every, every major user feature I can imagine over the next few years is JavaScript heavy. It's the new editor. It's the changing how widgets work. It's the making all those pages infinite scroll and dynamic instead of being like a thing you have to paginate through. Um, those are all really JavaScript heavy things. The PHP stuff is updates. Next version of language packs. It's, it's really the stuff that has to happen server side, which is getting smaller and smaller. Oh, we're utilizing the libraries wherever possible. Now, the cool thing is that like, if you actually look at the backbone, it's really tiny. Like, it doesn't add a lot, but it, it gives us a lot of convenience. Um, jQuery is a lot heavier, um, but we hitched a horse to it. So I could see jQuery being core for you know, a while to come. Uh, before jQuery, we used prototype. And so I don't know if there's still a compatibility library of prototype and core. Um, but that's a good example of we can transition things. It's just that we want to try to not do that too often. You know, we don't want to be ADD with it. So as we, as we choose something like moving from prototype to jQuery, we were betting, I think rightly so, that jQuery was going to be something we could work with and evolve with, co-evolve with over the next three to five to eight years, which we've been able to. Oh, how about a gentleman right here? Hi, my name is Peter. So to kind of dovetail that question about the JavaScript and the front end or the client side, you see that also transitioning into the back end and server side, making implementations into Node.js server side scripting support, changing the way the PHP goes into the database. Not so much, and it's really about portability. So, I mean, there's no better language for distribution in the world than PHP right now. It can run anywhere. You can run it on, you know, AWS. You can run it on Microsoft Azure. You can run it on Rackspace. You can run it on every place. PHP Fog, uh, GoDaddy. Like, just the, the ability to distribute and run in a pretty efficient way with PHP is better than anything else out there. And I honestly don't see that changing in the near term. Just on a, the way that Node, the same way Ruby got very, very popular, but never really became popular in a shared hosting context. I think there's things that are fundamental to the, to the virtual machine that's at the core of these languages that PHP, for all its warts and ugliness, is the best in the world at um, running in this shared environment. And these other languages, I don't think, take that use case into, including Node and server-side JavaScript stuff. Like, don't take that into effect in the same way. So foreseeable future, WordPress is, uh, is PHP. But let's, let's think 18 years down the line when really WordPress is 90% JavaScript code, 10% PHP code, and works over an API. In theory, something that re-implemented that API on the server side, that 10%, it might be something that people could implement in different languages. I mean, as long as the API spoke the same language, Really, the bulk of what WordPress means is now this client-side code. So could someone create a node or Ruby or some other sort of server part of it that spoke to this API? Yeah, totally. But, uh, lady back there. Hi, my name's Elizabeth, and um, I'm going to switch subjects a little bit. So I know that in 2009, you made the decision not to succumb to censorship in China. 
Um, and so therefore, WordPress is effectively blocked in China. And first of all, I want to thank you for that. Um, and secondly, I want to just find out what brought you to that decision, what you gave up to making that decision, and what do you think of countries like China and other countries that have a lot more control on blogging and micro-blogging and the future of those countries? Sure. Uh, I think it was actually earlier than 2009. There was press about it in 2009, but the decision happened when Automatic was really small, like maybe five or six people. And at the time, it was a quarter of our traffic was coming from China. Um, so it was a big drop in traffic. It was really just one of those things where the way, I honestly don't know how it works now, but at the time, the way they implemented censorship, I thought was particularly insidious. Because they didn't actually censor you. They strongly encouraged you to self-censor your own service. And they wouldn't say, like, here's a list of terms that you can't have on Chinese blogs. They said, you know, whatever you think would be, promote the most harmonious society. You should maybe, that's actually the word they use, some equivalent of the translation of harmonious or harmonizing. Um, and that just, that seems so bad. <laughs> it's a very big brother. Um, I will also say that I used to be on much more of a high horse about how China approaches the internet versus the United States. Where there have been a lot of revelations this year. <laughs> where it turns out that we've been doing some kind of sketchy things as well. Um, maybe not aimed at overt censorship in the same way, but I think that privacy is key to a free society. And the ability to have private conversations and communications and anonymous publications and things like that um, well, are the only thing. Censorship and privacy are different things. Well, I think that censorship and privacy are very related and that if you, well, it's more related to anonymity. So, I mean, the founding fathers were the Snowdens of their time. I mean, they were, they were publishing essays and things pseudonymously or anonymously um, that the existing regime did not believe in. They were, they were treasonous, right, to, the, to England and the UK. Um, I guess England and the UK didn't exist. Uh, the King George. The King George. So I think that regardless of, of what any of us believe in a society at any given time, we have to recognize the fact that some of what seems uh, terrible today or treasonous or anything might be what we look to as the foundation in the future. Um, and often some of the most powerful ideas are minority first. And so the ability, the freedom of speech is very, very key. And that sort of goes to the censorship. But I think the ability to publish anonymously and have ideas that you can publish without repercussions and the ideas can stand on their own is also really, really important to a free society. That I think it's terrible that uh, a whistleblower is right now safer in Russia than America. <laughs> Whatever that means. Um, it's kind of crazy. And there, you know, for all you might consider about there's channels to report these abuses or things like that, from all we've seen so far, it was so much worse than anyone could have imagined, even some of the most paranoid tinfoil hat wearing people. And um, all the guys, the Thomas Drakes of the world, who reported things and tried to go through proper channels before the NSA and previously, kind of had their lives really, really screwed up and ultimately were cut off in terrible ways and go through years-long la lawsuits and everything. So that's um, this is part of the reason I believe in open source. <laughs> Because how can you really trust the system you're running on unless you can peek under the hood and look at the code? Uh, I blog about this sometimes as well. So subscribe to ma.tt if you want to see occasional links and rants on this issue. Um, so you asked how I feel in comparison to other countries. Uh, I'm glad that there is freedom of speech in the United States and that we are having very open conversations around these revelations. Um, I think that it's actually many of our laws are quite good, like around DMCA and how things get taken down. Um, perfect, no. Copyright still has a very heavy hand in how patents work, how copyright law in itself works, and how things get taken down. But it's actually not a bad balance. And I can see a path forward for it being better. And that's honestly what I hope the most. So when these, some of the crazy stuff that came out of the NSA stuff, or NSA revelations, um, I'm optimistic. So when that is revealed, I feel like now we're going to have a more open conversation about it. 
and perhaps as a country we can come together either through our right of voting or you know, influencing our, our leaders to change how that works. And that's actually really, 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 really powerful. And so uh, I'm excited about that. But I don't, I'm not on a high horse as much as I used to be. <laughs> Yeah. Opening an office here. I mean, I, I didn't realize it was a waste of money in public, and I looked at the filing, and they closed the user base down to the single digits. It's like 600. <laughs> but the Wix Lounge, the office, is a very handy, handy feature. Huh. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how, how Automatic works is it's totally distributed. So, Automatic, uh, the company I work at, is now 220 people, uh, spread across 170 cities. We do have a few folks in the New York metropolitan area. I don't think any of them are here tonight. Uh, partially because one of the guys, who you guys probably know, Bo Levins, um, is in Denver meeting with a few of his colleagues. So because everyone works from all over the world, um, we do frequent meetups. The cool thing about this is I can also be anywhere. Like if there was an office with 200 people in it and I was gallivanting around, um, I probably wouldn't be doing my job for very long, or certainly not doing my job well. But because I can be just as present and effective any place as a, a keyboard and internet connection, um, I can kind of choose. And lately I've been choosing to spend a lot more time of my time in New York. I just got a new place. Uh, I've had an apartment here actually for two years, um, but it wasn't that great, so I just moved and um, found the Manhattan Unicorn where it's actually bigger and cheaper than my old place. <laughs> And, uh, and a cooler neighborhood as well. So I'm more now on the edge of like Soho, Nolita, Little Italy, Chinatown, that whole kind of nexus of neighborhoods. And I love exploring it. The reason I originally came to New York because it, it scared me. Um, I know if you make it here, you can make it anywhere. But like, <laughs> as, a, as a Texas boy, <laughs> it's a very, uh, it was a very intimidating city. And I'd come here for a business, usually a few times a year, and just felt totally lost. And intimidated by the city, and I felt like the only way I was ever going to figure it out was just diving in the deep end. And uh, it's pretty amazing because, I'm sure you guys know this, you all live here, I'm preaching to the choir, but like, you can learn, you can spend your whole lifetime learning something, and New York is always changing, and there'd be new things. Uh, even in between trips, like the restaurants on my block change. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like I'm in a whole different neighborhood. <laughs> it's, uh, I love that, the energy here. Uh, we'll see how the, uh, the winter goes. <laughs> I'm not big on cold. Uh, <laughs> that's not that big of an apartment. <laughs> but um, enjoying it a lot. And so uh, I'll probably sneak into one of the WordPress meetups in the future and just stand in the back like I was earlier. Oh, but office, no. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> kind of forgot the original question. Now, we only have one office, it's a headquarters in San Francisco. And honestly, it's beautiful. It's like 15,000 square feet, it's a great space. And on most days, there's five or six people there. <laughs> We're not really, and we have maybe 20 people in the Bay Area. So uh, it's really hard for us to, I do believe we have some co-working desks and things both in New York and all over the world. But we really, people, we allow people to work wherever they are. Um, if you want to read more about this, a book actually just came out about how automatic works. Uh, not written by us, but it's called A Year Without Pants. Oh, Scott was here. Oh, cool. You guys all heard about it. So if you haven't heard about it yet, um, check out A Year Without Pants. I feel kind of silly saying that, but it's a good book, funny title. <laughs> and uh, it tells you all about how we work and why, why we're not going to open an office. And then one day wanders the Wix Lounge. They moved from 19th Street to take a ticket, pick up somewhere in Florida. Yeah. There's some great offices here. Like I visit, well, I visit some great co-working spaces. The Squarespace office is amazing, but it's just not us. All right there. Oh, you actually had your hand up beforehand. So uh, front. Just a, just a quick question about um, about one of the later, one of the more recent updates. Uh, I work with students. Mm -hmm. Oh, the blog roll. Yeah, the, the blog roll yeah. is gone, and so they're coming to me. 
with why, why, why. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if I can get from you why, why, why. What do I tell them from that? Well, it might have been a bug. So that links feature is still in WordPress. It just if you do a fresh install, it's hidden. No, that, that, that's what I mean. For those who oh. have fresh data, like in my last install, it was there, and now I got a one. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's, it, you know, to starting something new, it is so hard to remove a feature. <laughs> um, yeah, the links, the blog role feature. Um, it just, there's a lot of code in database tables for something that we found a very small percentage of users were using. And it could be done just as a widget. So I don't think that we've done that transition as well as it could be. Because, again, if you're setting up a new blog, it's just kind of hidden. Um, I think there's a flag to turn it on, but if, essentially consider it hidden. And we haven't yet done and core a really great widget to replace it, which I think we should. So the user's not wrong. That's our fault. Be totally honest. Like uh, we get really excited about taking things out, and because <laughs> we never get to do it. <laughs> and so sometimes I think that we can front load that process a little more and forget about the follow through. So we should, Helen, let's write that down. <laughs> Maybe a good three niner thing, like uh, to have a really fantastic link widgets, links widget in core. Just all client side, right? Not needing two database tables. So there's a couple of protocols that WordPress has used for a while, specifically XML, RPC, and RSS. Uh -huh. They've been around for a while. They've been pretty much the same for a while. But WordPress has gotten pretty big. So it has the ability to throw its way around if it thinks that there's something that can and should be changed. Do you see WordPress pushing to make some revolutions to those protocols in the future? Yes. <laughs> um, and there's two specific things I can point you to. Um, one, there's a, a REST API that was where it started as a Google Summer of Code project and is now going to be one of these plugins as a feature slated for a future release. So if you're passionate about a JSON API to WordPress, um, check it out. There's also one that I'm personally advocating for and hope to get in before 4 p.m. tomorrow because <laughs> I have to follow my own rules too. I don't know the ticket number off the top of my head, if anyone could look it up, it's a RSS uh, JS. So basically, uh, you know, WordPress has feeds for everything. It's actually one of the coolest features. So uh, anything you can view on the front end, any tag page, any search, you can view a feed of that. And you can view that feed in RSS2, RSS1, Atom 0.3, Atom 1.0. So we support four by default. I want to add a fifth, which is basically a JSON representation of that feed. Uh, with the ability to have a callback. Uh, JSON is a, is a JavaScript data format, uh, J-S-O-N. Some people call it JSON. I call it JSON, potato, patata, you know. It's basically, it's a, it's a very concise way to show, to represent programming, pro programmatic data structures. Um, much more concise than anything. And because it's JavaScript, that it can be consumed natively. And because we'll have callback support in this, if this ticket goes through, um, you'll be able to actually integrate these feeds completely client-side, which I think will be really, 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 really cool. And this is an area you ask, well, how many people support RSS JSS, right? RSS JS right now? And the answer is almost no one. But I think we could get 20% of the web on it. <laughs> and I'm curious to see what would happen after that. What was the first plugin you mentioned? Oh, the REST API. So if you go to make.wordpress.org core and click on the features as plugins in the sidebar, it's one of the top ones, I believe. And that'll take you to where we've been talking about it, P2 post about it, and uh, you can get in touch with the guy. Did anyone look up what that RSSJS track ticket is? You know the number? 25639. So if everyone could go comment on ticket 25639 tonight, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll DDoS it. Um, really hoping to get it in by tomorrow. Just a real quick follow-up question. If that's the case, do you see WordPress moving away from SimplePy as a way to parse RSS? That's a good question. So once we have this JSON feed support in core, really the only thing we use the feed reading stuff, which is a pretty substantial library to include in WordPress, is that little list of headlines on the dashboard. That's all we use it for. So <laughs> that could be an opportunity for something that we stop loading by default or that we don't need to load on the index.php. Um, I even remember a few years ago, I was doing some hardcore profiling of WordPress code. 
Simplify added a pretty significant overhead on pages where we loaded it. So. Um, just as someone who's using it for plugin development, please keep the, uh, the functions available somewhere, whatever it's doing. We always keep stuff in there for sometimes years. Like I said, I don't know if prototype's still in there. It might be. But if it's not, we left it in there for like four years before we finally took it out. Cool. Uh, let's say last question right there in the middle. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> um, it's kind of no pressure. I guess. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, do you use a markdown at all? I'm interested in it and wondering if you ever could do that. I forgot to announce that. So hold on before your next question. Uh, WordPress.com, as of about well three hours ago now, sports markdown. Oh wow! Yes. I literally, I was, I was like, okay, going up, I'm going to give away the cases, so now it's marked down. Give away the case. I just, I, yeah, obviously, I'm a goldfish right. in here. So, yeah, I, I, I don't use it personally that much. I like HTML, um, but I think it's an awesome thing to support. Well, and the second question is pretty facetious. Uh, since you have a .tt uh, URL, have you ever been to internet? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So, if, if you want to check it, so Twitter, at Photomat. Again, I said I got stuck with this photo thing, but luckily I still like photography. And my URL is ma.tt. No .com, no www, no anything. Um, turns out .tt is, as you said, Trinidad and Tobago. It was weird when I bought this. So it was unregistered. Literally no one had registered it before. And the reason is that the, the Trinidad, Trinidadian and Tobagan registry is super old school. Like old school enough, like I typed it's just like, it looks like a web page from the 90s. I typed my information in the forum saying I was interested in the domain. And I got a form mail email back to myself. Like literally it said like first underscore name equals Matt, last underscore name equals Molloy. <laughs> and then uh, it was unregistered. There, the cost is weird. So it's like $1,000 for the first two years and then $1,000 for the next five years. I was like, this is my name. This is a good investment. And I actually like blogged or tweeted like, just made a major life purchase. <laughs> and some gossip website was like, did he buy a wedding ring? Did he buy a house? Like, <laughs> they don't know to a geek the domain name. It's just as important, if not more, than any of those things. And, um, but the weird thing was, so there's no way to pay by credit card. So literally, I walk into Bank of America, and I'm right, you know, you have, if you've ever sent a wire, you have to fill out this super long form and they're like, uh, so you're sending this money to this bank in Trinidad? Are you sure about it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I saw it on the internet. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it's been great chatting. <laughs>